Absolutely. And I'm going to share my screen, which why do you not want to let me share my screen? With this one? There we go, share screen. And we're going to share this screen right there. And can everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. You should see the PowerPoint. Okay, let me just get the other part of the PowerPoint open. Okay, so who's what, who's where and what's when, and we are going to be talking uh, for the next eight weeks about who's what and where, what's when. So I need you to get that blank piece of paper that I asked you to find, whether it's a napkin, an envelope, I don't really care. <laughs> We're going to be drawing a line to help get the feel of the storyline. So I want you to make a short straight line not too long. And then I want you to put a squiggly line <laughs> on that line. See, I told you this is going to be not too hard. Then two lines, two parallel lines. And now I want you to make seven loops. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They don't have to be perfectly looped, but it's the idea of we've got seven things going on, seven cycles that occur. Then another straight line. And then I want you to make a fork in that line. And the top one, I want you to make another line and stop. And the bottom line, we're going to make a longer line. And then we're going to come back up and over. And that's the Old Testament. Believe it or not, that's the Old Testament. Doesn't look like it yet, but it will be. <laughs> so now let's draw the New Testament. The New Testament starts with an arrow down, and I can I bet you can guess what that arrow down is about. Uh, that's Jesus coming. And then we have a, a, another longer line, and we have an arrow up and an arrow down, a bunch of squiggles. <laughs> uh, the squiggles are really important. And then we have branching out. And then we have a dotted line because this is kind of from when the Bible ended until now. And then we have an arrow down and an arrow up. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, we're gonna talk through this and we're gonna use this over and over again and it'll make sense as we go. And you'll be able to sit and go, we have the line and the squiggle and the lines. And you can, what I will often do when I'm sharing this with people is I will often talk through what we're uh, talking about in the storyline and draw the line as I go. But it's helpful just to have that visual to get started. So let's start out with the, the timeline of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You probably know that story, that first line in the Bible. Um, and it talks about how God created the different parts of the world and made man last and gave man a rule. Gave him a woman and gave him both one rule. And it was don't eat the fruit from that tree. Except Satan had other ideas and, you know, did what he does. And he kind of tricked them into um into what he's doing did i remember to hit record uh i think i could. yes you did you i did it. oh good okay yes. um so so we have the fall and that fall occurs when we choose to eat the apple and get kicked out of the garden and then people get worse and worse and worse and god gets pretty fed up with people and he decides that's it i am wiping it out and starting over again so he tells Noah, go build a boat. Of course, it hasn't rained and they don't live anywhere close to water. So this is pretty peculiar. And it's a really big boat that he has to build. And God sends two of every, every kind of animal on. And Noah and his family go in the boat. And we have 40 days of rain and, and floods and the world gets wiped out. And we start over again. Land comes and Noah sends out the the birds and one comes finally comes back with a, an olive branch and then doesn't come back so they know that it's time to go out so they come out and they start over again and so they plant their fields and they have more kids and the population grows and they decide we are going to get to god we really want to be like god and so let's build a tower that gets us right up to god well god wasn't real excited about this and so he said, 
you know, we have to stop this. And so he confuses the languages of the people and the people can no longer talk to each other. And so they wind up having people groups and they disperse out across the Middle East with the different people groups. And if you do any language study, you can trace it back to several types of language, kind of validates what God was doing. Of course, the scientists won't tell you that, but it kind of does fit. So we have the Tower of Babel that happens. And then God, the, the story goes from focusing on the whole world to focusing on one particular guy. And his name is Abram and God changes his name to Abraham. And he makes some promises to him. He said, I'm going to give you all this land. I'm going to make a great nation from you. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. And he makes a bunch of promises. And one of them is that he's going to have a son and his son doesn't come for a while. And he says, oh, maybe I did it wrong. And so they have a son with his, his wife's maid and it creates all kinds of problems. And then they finally have this boy. And when he's about 13, God said, I want you to take this boy and go sacrifice him. Oh, this thing I waited all this time, you want me to go sacrifice. So God was testing Abraham and he brought him up on the mountain and asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And just as he's about to plunge the knife into his son, the angel stops him and God provides a ram. God provides a sacrifice for him to replace him and um, reinforces Abraham's faith and they continue to grow and Abraham has sons and they become the patriarchs. The Jews will refer to them as the, five, the founding fathers and we have Abraham, um, Isaac, Jacob and Esau, and then we have the 12 tribes. So we go and we build the nation of Israel. And Things are going along okay, except we have um, in this family of 12, in our fourth generation from Abraham, there's a lot of jealousy that goes on and the boys sell, he's one of the youngest sons at this point in time off and he gets transported off to Egypt and he becomes a ruler of Egypt and a famine hits the land. The famine hits the land and the Jews are hungry. And so we have our family of 12 going to visit Egypt to get to the to get to food. And they wind up asking for their brother Joseph for food. And it's an interesting story to see the dynamics play out. And, and Joseph extends grace and talks about how God was working at that point in time and uh, took care of them and was going to provide. He could have been really nasty to them to pay back, but no, he chose. He chose to extend grace to them and says, come on back, go get dad and the rest of the family and move to Egypt. And so the nation of Egypt, Israel winds up in Egypt right at the end of Genesis. And so this is the, this is the book of Genesis. There's a lot that goes on in Genesis. It's full of a lot of stories and we'll go into more detail on that next week. And this section of the Bible, we went from creation then we go to patriarchs and promises. The patriarchs were those four guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And Jacob is the one we focus on. And then Joseph, the four uh, patriarchs. So we are in Egypt and the time comes and the, the people forget, the rulers of Egypt forget about the promise that Joseph had with these people to, to care for them and work for them. And <laughs> to care for them and work for them. And the, the Jews continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the Pharaoh's like, this is not good. These people are gonna take over our nation. And so they turn them into slaves and it's very hard labor. And they are the ones who wind up building the pyramids and, and some of the other things that were, were built during that time in Egypt. And it's a very difficult, hard time. And so the people cry out to God for a deliverer and God sends them Moses. Have you seen the movie, The Ten Commandments? Well, that was Moses, the guy who was going to lead the people. And he goes to Pharaoh and let my people go so we can worship God. No, no. And he sends frogs and lice. And he sends all kinds of plagues to them to, to kind of make the Egyptians want to get rid of these people. And 
interestingly, God has all this awful stuff happen to the Egyptians, but none of it happens to the Israelites. Well, the final, the final point in the story is he, because Pharaoh kept saying no, is God causes a, um, a death, a, a death, the angel of death to come and kill all the firstborn. But he tells the Jews, I want you to kill a lamb and I want you to put some of the lamb's blood on the door frame. And he says, I want you to put it on the top and the two sides. Now watch what my hand is doing when I paint that. I pick up my little bit up from the bowl in the bottom and I hit the top and the two sides. You see what shape I'm making? Do it with me with your hand. You, you picture a door frame in front of you and you pick up a little blood with your little scrubby brush and go to the top and then the two sides of the door frame. Did you see what shape your hand is making? Top and then across. Little Puma cross? Yes, it makes a cross. <laughs> Mm. And we have the sacrifice of the lamb, we have the blood of the lamb, and we have a picture of the cross. And any family that had the blood on the door, when I see the blood, I will pass over. And that's what Jews celebrate today, the Passover. And there's a ton of symbolism about Jesus in the Passover we'll talk about next week, but they, they don't see it. Their, their eyes are blinded from seeing that. But anyway, so... So Pharaoh is like, get out of here, go, go, go. And the, and the Egyptians give them jewelry and they just say, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. And so they go and they get to this big body of water, the Red Sea. What are we going to do? The Egyptians are coming. They changed their mind. And when they hit the Red Sea, Moses has the waters divide and they walk across on dry land. And as the Egyptians catch up with them, and we're talking lots and lots and lots and lots of people, like a million people going, going across. And the Egyptians follow and the water floods them over and kills all the Egyptians. So God delivers the Israelites into the promised land, that land that was promised to Abraham. And so they get there, except they don't immediately go and do what God tells them to do. And so they wander and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And during that time of wandering, and that's my squiggly line, their shoes don't wear out. God provides food for them. He has manna come from, um, manna come, come up from the ground. And manna, the word manna means, what is it? We don't really know what it is. Some people say it was like Rice like Krispies, but he had them go gather as much as they could for one day. And that's all they were allowed to do, except on the sixth day, they were supposed to take a double portion. And so they, they took a double portion. And so they were ready for the Sabbath day so they could rest on the Sabbath day. Now, people being people as people are, didn't necessarily believe God was going to keep doing this. And so sometimes everybody had to learn the hard way. They gathered more just in case God didn't provide. And that got all maggoty and disgusting and gross. So they got a real visual lesson about that. During this time, God gives the Ten Commandments and all kinds of law and sets up the structure of how he wants the people to go. So 40 years go and go by and the, the generation that didn't believe God and didn't trust God that he was going to do this and take care of them dies and we're ready for the next generation to enter into the promised land because they had been wandering in the desert of Sinai to get to the promised land. It was a very circuitous road. It, route. It would never have taken as long as, as they were wandering out there. But God also was with them and he showed them that he was with them and he had a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he taught them to make the tabernacle, which was a structure similar to the temple where they could worship 
and they divided them up into the 12 tribes and everybody got their allocated land. And so it was a pretty organized system that they had. So we get to the promised land and it's time to go in. So Moses sends some spies into the promised land to check things out. So they're looking around and seeing how things are and, um, and Rahab saves them. Um, Rahab, who's a prostitute, provides shelter for them because the, um, <laughs> because the, you know, well, the spies are in the land, they hear. And so she hides them and they make a deal to protect her. And so these spies go back and they tell that there's 12 spies and 10 of them are like, oh, it's impossible. The people were giants. We can never do this. And they carry back this giant grape cluster that shows the bounty of fruit in the promised land, how, how rich and how fertile it is. But the 10 of them are scared. And Joshua and Caleb are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got God. God can do this. God can do this. And so they make the decision to go forward to conquer the promised land. And this, this is this, we now have gone through Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So we've gone through uh, and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. We've gone through all of the five books of the law. And at this point, we call, we refer to that as the Exodus because it's leaving and getting ready to go into the promised land. So it's time to conquer the promised land. And God tells, jo tells jo um, Joshua what to do. They are to take the whole nation of Israel and they're supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God that was built as part of the tabernacle. And they're supposed to walk around the city. All these people were supposed to walk around the walls of the city. Now, picture your town. And you guys are hanging out in your house doing your own thing and you find out close to a million people are walking in a parade around your place, not saying anything pretty scary time <laughs> they and they were wondering what is going on what is going on and so on the seventh day they walk they're taught they're told to walk around seven times and the priests are supposed to play their trumpets and and in the at, at the very end they have a shout and the city walls come crashing down except for Rahab who had been told to put a red cord in her window and we have the red symbolizing the blood of Jesus that protected her. The, the, another connection, it was that very important that it was red and went that, that, that cord helped to help her go over. So, so they conquer the city and the walls go down and they move in. And that is the story of the book of Joshua. And Joshua is a book that tells us about leaders and it's, it's, it's actually a really good story that goes on. And so we've conquested the city and we go in and we start settling the promised land and they're told explicitly, drive out the idolatries, the idolatrous people that are here. We want you to take over the land and we want you to take it over for us and I'll be with you. And you're supposed to do what I want you to do. Well, you know, even though the Israelites had said, yes, God, we'll do whatever you want. We'll do, we'll do. We'll thank you, God. They had, you know, this big worship and all when the, when the um, walls came tumbling down. But they eventually forgot and they intermarried. And so we had a bunch of problems going on. And this is where we come into the cycle of the judges. And the cycle in the cycle of judges happened seven times. This is the book of Judges. And it starts out there in a really peaceful setting, but then the people fall into sin. And God has to teach them a lesson because they're not getting it. So there's some punishment. And the people cry out, help, help God, help God. And he sends a deliverer. And those deliverers were the judges. And this cycle happens seven times over 400 years. And the judges include Gideon. You may know the story of Gideon, who God called him and he's like, I I'm not a leader. No, 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 no. And he puts a fleece out. He said, let me make sure it's really you, God. And he puts a fleece out and he said, here's how I'll know it's you. If I wake up tomorrow and the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, I'll know it's you. Okay, so God does what he asks and he wakes up in the morning and the fleece is dry 
and the ground is wet. Well, maybe I, maybe I didn't understand, right? Let me, let me really make sure. So tomorrow I'd like the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. You know, I, I, think, God, I think God just laughs at some of these things. And so God takes care of him. And eventually Gideon realizes, all right, well, I, I better do this. And he assembles an army to, to get ready to throw out, overthrow the Midianites. And he has this big group of men ready to go conquer the Midianites. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. you got too many people. Huh? <laughs> we, we need to weed this out. So he says, I want you to take them to get a drink at the brook. And the people who lap the water with their hand versus the people who stick, the, stick their face in the water are the soldiers I want you to keep. And so the army gets weeded from a very big group down to 300 men. And he's a little nervous about this. And so God has him create it has people create torches and put lamps uh, like jars over the torches so that they were hidden. And the job was to go down to the camp and, and they, they had some spooky things go on so that the soldiers started to be a little bit concerned. And they go down into the camp and on the signal, they all shout for the Lord and for Gideon and they crash their pottery that's hiding the light. And so these, these people who are sleeping wake up, they hear this big commotion, this big crash, see all this light. They don't know it's 300 people, but all kinds of commotion happens in, in, the, in, the, in their area and they all start killing each other and running away. So God conquers the Midianites with Gideon and 300 men in a way that you would never anticipate winning a war. And God does similar things throughout the book of Judges. You'll see Deborah, you'll see stories about a bunch of them. Another famous one that you probably have heard of is Samson. And Samson was the big, strong guy, and he had a wife who tricked him, Delilah. He was actually raised as a Nazarite, but he demonstrated extraordinary strength and um, the, 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 the bad guys in our story wanted to find out what made him so strong. And so she tricks him to a bunch of things and he lies. And then he finally says, it's my hair. And so they cut off his hair and poke out his eyes. And it's really terrible. They chain him up to a pole. And with his strength, the last thing he finally winds up doing is pulling down the poles of the big, big building that they're in. And it collapses the building. A bunch of people die and they get scared. And and God delivers the people yet again. So that kind of cycle happens seven times. And so we have the period of judges. So we've gone from creation when God created the world. And we have all the early stories with the promises and the patriarchs. The exodus where they're wandering around the desert to get to the promised land. Joshua, who leads them into the promised land with the walls tumbling down. And the period of judges where we have seven cycles repeating where they just don't get it and God has to teach them a lesson. So the people have been following God for a while and they, they look around to the neighboring communities and say, well, we don't want it this any, anymore. We don't want this theocracy thing. We want a king just like everybody else has. And God says, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that's such a good idea, but if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. And so we get a king. And we have three period, three significant kings in this period of time. We start out with Saul, who when Samuel goes to find him, he's hiding behind the luggage because he just doesn't want to do this. Apparently very tall guy. He kind of missed the point about following God. And and the next king God called was David. And Saul and da Saul's son, Jonathan and David were best friends. Saul was crazy jealous of David, who was going to become the next king, tried to kill him a couple times. But David eventually becomes king, takes over. Now, this is the same David who we hear about the story with David and Goliath. While Saul was ruling, there was a battle between the, the Midianites again, and Midianites, I think it's Midianites, I know that I said that I'm not 100% sure, but anyway, um, between uh, the Israel and 
the let's say the Midianites, I'll look that up for sure. And and David is the youngest son with a bunch of older brothers who are fighting in the war. Now, the bad guys have this big, tall, giant guy that, that, that every day he comes marching out and says, let's not have this war stuff. Here's what we want to do. Let's have a fight. You send your best guy against me and we'll fight. And the one who wins, wins, wins the oh. And they're all shaking in their boots. We can't do this. The sky is too big. So every day he comes back. And one day David's dad sends him down to see how his brothers are doing, sends along some cheese. And he hears this and he gets mad. Like, what do you mean we have God? How are you not, how are you not getting this? All we have to do is go beat this guy. And so Saul gives him his armor and Saul's a big, tall guy. And, and David is a teenager and it's much too big for him. And so he puts his armor on and, um, says, forget it, forget it. I want to use the tools that I use. Now, David was a shepherd and he was used to fending away wild animals with a slingshot. And so he took five stones, he prayed and he took five stones and he, he says, okay, Goliath, I'm going to challenge you. And so they, you know, we have our two battle lines and in the middle of the field, David challenges Goliath and Goliath said, what am I, a dog that you send a boy with sticks to throw at me? And David takes his slingshot, whack, 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 knocks Goliath in the head and kills him. And so David becomes a hero and, the, and Saul is all kinds of jealous and upset. And this goes on for a while until David becomes king. So David becomes king and we have some issues that go on with David, um, sin issues. But primarily David is known as a man after God's own heart. And he writes a lot of the book of Psalms and he loved to worship. And he, there was one time there was a parade and he was just dancing wildly. And his wife, who was Saul's daughter, he gave her the daughter at one point, um, criticizes him. And he's like, you know, you're, you're running around half naked and you're worshiping. This is so embarrassing. And he's like, I'm going to worship who I'm going to worship. And now I'm going to worship. And so David builds his big, his big home and wants to build the temple. And God says, no. I don't want you to build the temple because there's blood on your hands. David had been a, a warrior and so he had killed him, but your son will build the temple. And I want to promise you, you will always have a son on the throne. And so the descendants of the kings to come were all descendants of David and Jesus is in the line of David. And in the New Testament, it talks about him being of the lineage of David. And that's why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to the house of David because he was part of David. They're both actually part of David's family. So we have our three kings and he says, no, you're not gonna do this, but your son is going to build the temple. And his son is Solomon. Do you remember anything about Solomon? Like, I know he's, one, there, are, there are some um, iconic things about Solomon. Do you, do you remember anything about Solomon at all? It's okay if you don't. Well, he wasn't he wasn't as highly regarded as David. That I know. No. Yeah. No, no, definitely not. Definitely okay. not. In walk through the Bible, we say Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. Because that was their perspective on on um on God. So Solomon is. When, when Solomon becomes king, he says, God says, I, I'll ask me for anything and I'll give you anything you want. He could have asked for riches. You could have asked for anything, but he asks for wisdom. And so Saul, Solomon becomes known as the wisest man to ever live. And the queen of Sheba comes to visit him and he winds up becoming very rich as well. And it's Solomon who winds up building the beautiful temple for the people to worship for, for the people to worship God and the, and the temple is unbelievably beautiful and they have a big celebration when it's time to dedicate the temple so a little bit more time goes on we're in the United Kingdom and we start having squabbles <laughs> kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats but not <laughs> You know, it was internal strife <laughs> that went on. And so we divide 
into the North and the South, kind of like happened in our country. And remember we had 12 tribes. And so the way the kingdom is divided, we have 10, 10 tribes go to the North and two tribes go to the South. And we have a whole series of kings that come. And in the North, the kings bounce a little from good once in a while, but mostly bad. And it becomes a mess. In that time, God sends the prophet Elijah to talk to them. And one of the big stories that happens here is the prophets of Baal, who are the, um, Baal is, a, is an idolatrous God, false God. And the prophets of Baal cha challenge Isaiah, uh, Elisha. And there's, there's, there's a drought. And Elisha says, well, we're going to solve this, this thing. And we're going to have a contest. And I want you guys to build it, build an altar and put a sacrifice on it. And I'll build an altar and a sacrifice. And the way God reacts is the way we'll see whose God is God. He said, but the one thing is you can't light the spire on the altar. Your God has to do that. And so they take their stones and they build their altar and they put the sacrifice on and they start dancing around and they start cutting themselves and they start screaming and crying. And Elisha just kind of stands there tapping his foot. What, what, what? Has your God gone to the bathroom? Is he busy? Where is he? Why hasn't he come? And so this goes on for a while and Elisha says, okay, fine. Let, let me show you whose God is God. And so he builds an altar, puts a sacrifice on it. But then he asks the servants to go get barrels of water and he pours barrels of water on these stones and this sacrifice and it's all swimming around in the trough by the time we're done. And he prays and he basically says, so, okay, God, show them who's God. And God sends fire down from heaven and it not only consumes the sacrifice, it consumes the stones and licks up all the water. Oh, wow, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And, and so the people leave the allegiance to Baal and recognize that Elijah is doing what, what he wants him to do. Um, and the, the king and queen at that time were Ahab and Jezebel. And maybe you've heard the term Jezebel to describe a woman who's, well, how is, a, how is a woman who's a Jezebel, no, she's a Jezebel. What, what does that mean if somebody calls a person a Jezebel? Well, I, I think it's a promiscuous. In some ways, yes, and she's it's just a very not nice person. And Jezebel right. was a very wicked queen. And so when this happened, Jezebel comes after Elijah. I'll get you, my, you and your little dog too. I mean, she's threatened. <laughs> And so he runs and he gets really depressed and God takes care of him and God helps him develop a leader to take, to take things on. And um, he winds up turning things over to Elisha and they continue ministering in the, in the, in the 10 tribes of the North, but God is finally fed up with this group of people and so, oh, let me come, let me come back, come back in a minute. Um, fed up with this group of people and he sends in the Assyrian army to come and capture them. And so they cart all the nation of Israel, the, the Northern tribes off to, it, off to Babylon, pretty far away, like 700 miles. And they go into exile and that's the end of the Northern kingdom. But the Southern Kingdom continues to go and has godly leaders and they continue to focus on God, mostly. After a while, the, the nation of Babylon comes and gets them and carts a bunch of them away, including a guy named Daniel, who is someone we hear about in the lion's den. So off to Babylon, a bunch of the Jews go and, and Daniel was one of them. And Daniel gets in trouble because he's praying and the, 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 the jealous bad guys, politicians, oh, your, your honor, he was praying, we have to get him. And so they throw him <laughs> into a pit of lions and oh, Daniel pets the lions and God protects him. And the king <laughs> realizes, oh, God is God. Hmm. So that happens over in Babylon with exile. So 
what we have is the is the na the northern nation was called Israel and the southern nation is called Judah. So Israel gets carted off to Assyria and Judah gets carted off to Babylon. And after 70 years, God says, okay, you can come back. Now, during this time in the return, when they get back to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a mess because of course it's been a conquered city and a few people had still been living there, but it, it was a mess and they have to rebuild the city when they get there. And that's where our lesson that we've been having in church about Nehemiah comes in. Nehemiah, is, Nehemiah heard about Jerusalem was being such a mess. Remember, he lived, he was the king's cupbearer, and he heard about the city being such a mess and asks the king, can I have some stuff and go back and see how this is doing? And the king liked him and he gave him passageway and he gave him letters to all kinds of kings along the way to give him supplies. So this king blessed him and they got back and, and Nehemiah rallies the people and they build the wall. Now they also have to rebuild the temple and God uses Zerubbabel, that's such a great name, to rebuild the temple and a prophet called Ezra to rebuild the people. So we have to get the people focused back on God because through all this time, God had been faithful, but they weren't. They kept forgetting about God and God punished them in a variety of different ways until they would turn back to God, but inevitably they would forget. You know, that's kind of like us sometimes. <laughs> you know, God has been so good and so faithful to us and we forget. And sometimes he has to get our attention and bring us back. So this is the whole Old Testament. We're rebuilding the city after the exile and the return. And then we have 400 silent years. And this is the period of waiting. So this covers the timeline from creation through the fall and the flood and the nations and Abraham and off to, Israel, off to Egypt and then through the Red Sea and the laws and all the, the, the rules and regulations. And then they go and they fight and the walls fall down and they don't fight they don't fight <laughs> they walk around and god makes the walls fall and god is showing them again and again i got you i got you back here um and they forget again and we have the cycle of the judges and then okay i'll give you the king if you want the king that's not the best idea but you know if you if you were a parent or maybe you remember your parents doing this with you well, you can do that if you really want to. I don't think it's a good idea, but you can, because sometimes we have to learn things the hard way, and that's how God does it. And then we had the, the it got worse and worse and the carted off to, to exile. So that's the timeline of the Old Testament. And we're going to see how, we're going to go through the New Testament, and then we're going to see how this all fits together. How are you guys doing? Do you need a break? Are you okay? I think I'm okay. Okay. All right, so here's the New Testament. Now, remember, I had you start by drawing an arrow down, and that arrow down represents Jesus coming. And you, we all know the Christmas story about how, how Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem, and when they got there, there was no room, so Jesus wound up being born in, uh, in a stable or an alley or somewhere they had access to a manger, which is a, cat's, uh, a, a cow's feeding dish. You have a rabbit and you have cats. Can you imagine putting a baby in your cat's feeding dish or your bunny's feet? Okay, now think about a cow or a donkey. Crazy. If you haven't seen any of the Chosen um, videos on TV, the Chosen, um, it, it, you can get it through an app. It's also available on, uh, on Amazon Prime. It's available on a couple different stations, and it's a retelling of the story of the life of Christ that absolutely humanizes the disciples and the people, and it's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And the way they retell the Christmas story is just unbelievable. That one is actually available um, on YouTube, and, oh. it, and it opens up with Mary riding the donkey and Joseph on their way, and she's really uncomfortable. Can I get down, Joseph, I'm really uncomfortable here. And like, you, you don't think about that stuff. So anyway, they tell the story really well. 
you know, crazy setting for a baby to be born, but it was a special baby with special purpose. And so the New Testament starts out with the life of Christ. And so our story begins with the life of Christ. Then Jesus is born and he calls his disciples, you know, he grows up, calls his disciples, does all kinds of miracles, all kinds of teaching. But eventually the, the, the um, Jewish leaders have him crucified because they are threatened by him. Well, we know that was part of God's plan, but Jesus dies on the cross and we know the tomb was empty. And so Jesus came back alive again, which is critical. And he becomes the final sacrifice for us. We don't have to sacrifice lambs and goats and, and things they had to sacrifice in the Old Testament. And before he goes to heaven, he gives the disciples some instructions. And he says, I want you to go and share this message with people to Jerusalem, which was their immediate location, Judea, which was the kind of like, if, if we go city, state, to the state, and Samaria. And they were the people they didn't like because the Samaritans had interbreeded during the period of exile and the, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. And Jesus said, I want you to go to them too. And then I want you to go to the uttermost. So I want you to bring the gospel to the Jews and then to the rest of the world. And that was the big direction that he gave them to the disciples. And he left. He went back to heaven and they watched him go back to heaven. Okay, now what do we do? <laughs> well, they were meeting and they were praying and talking and trying to figure out what to do. And God sends down the Holy Spirit on this group of people and they start speaking in languages they don't know and this was during the festival of, of uh, Pentecost and the Jews would gather in Jerusalem for these big festivals and there are all these Jews from all over the world and they're listening and they're hearing people talking in their language not just speaking Aramaic or, or Hebrew or whatever was common in the area but their language and they were hearing the message about Jesus came to be the savior of the world and so 3,000 people believe, and the church is born. And we have our church in Jerusalem, and they're happily living, happily living there. Well, not quite happily, because the Jewish leaders were not real excited about this. And so they were making things a little bit difficult for them. And God thought, you know what? <laughs> if these people don't have a push to do this, they're never going to get out of Jerusalem. So he creates, he has some persecution come to the church. And they separate. We also have the, the people who were there celebrating Pentecost went back with this message. So it started getting dispersed. But the, the, the Jews with persecution began to move around and the gospel began to spread out. And we began to get new churches forming in the area. And then God brought in Peter and Paul to share the message, Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. And the gospel continued to go and grow and grow and grow. And then Paul writes letters to the churches where he has been. And then it kind the timeline, the history kind of ends. Jews then Gentiles, Peter then Paul. And the timeline of the New Testament kind of ends. And we have this period, which includes now, where Jesus promises, I'm going to come again and I'm going to take my church back to heaven. And you need to tell everybody so they can come with us because the people that don't believe aren't coming to heaven, they're going to hell. And so we have a job to do and here we are. And sometime in the future could be tomorrow because it could be, they, they were talking soon in the New Testament. He's going to come back and he's going to be coming on a white horse to be conquering. And he's going to take his bride, the church, and the believers are going to go back to heaven Satan's going to get destroyed and the world is going to get destroyed and we're going to all live happily ever after in heaven, which is a pretty cool thing. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting if you look at the parallels of the, of the fairy tales that came up as folk tales throughout time. There was a problem and a deliverer came to help and rescue them and they ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after similar to what, what's going to happen for us. So that's the timeline of the New Testament. So there we go, soup to nuts, from creation to Jesus returning. Great. Okay, I, I got the story, a bunch of stories go on. And I'm going to give you these slides. I'm going to send you these slides when we're done. So let's take a look at the books of the Bible. The books of the Bible are kind of like a library. There's 66 books, but it contains one story. 
And the story is basically God loves his people and wants to be with them and wants to provide for them, but people are stubborn and they mess up and God gives them other chances. And so the Bible is divided into two sections. We have the Old Testament, which is before Christ, and the New Testament, which is after Christ. Mm -hmm. And while we think it would be halfway, it's not. It's more, There's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. And it's about three quarters and one quarter space of pages. The dead center of the Bible is the book of Psalms. So if you take a paper Bible and you put it on on its spine and open it to the dead center, you're gonna be in the Psalms, which is a great place because there's all kinds of good things in there. Now, just like a library has a lot of books, there's a sense of organization to it. And this is, this is rarely taught, but it's really pretty cool how the organization here works. Um, just to review the, the Old Testament and the New Testament differences, the Old Testament happens before Christ, and the New Testament happens after Christ, 39 books, 29 books. The Old Testament really focuses on the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. The New Testament, once Jesus is done, focuses on the church, God's chosen people, with a job to tell. And uh, the Old Testament was all about laws and rules, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to make sacrifices, and if you sin, you have to make a sacrifice, and it was all set up to say, wow, this is hard. I can't do this myself. It was a sick system of sacrifices showing them they needed a savior to help them. They couldn't do it on their own, and it was pointing to the savior to come, who was Jesus. The New Testament is all about grace. Grace there's a, an acronym for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. We get heaven, we get God, we get the Holy Spirit, we get it all because Jesus died on the cross for us. That's pretty amazing. And grace is a gift. And even though it's been given to us as a gift, many people still feel like they have to work for it. And it's like, no, 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 it, it's a gift. Just you know, faith, faith gets you there and the rest follows. Jesus also becomes the final sacrifice, the blood of a lamb. Sacrifice, they call him the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's a lot of pictures of Jesus that come in the Old Testament. And so we go from needing a savior to recognizing I have a savior and learning how to live that way. The dividing line between the old and the new is Jesus, the birth of Jesus. So that's one way we can, you know, if we're thinking about stories and we want to figure out where something is, is it related to Jesus or is it before Jesus? Now, the way the Old Testament is sectioned off, the Old Testament is actually broken into sections. We mm -hmm. have the law, the history, the poetry, the major prophets, the minor prophets. And the way to remember the breakdown is a, is a little pattern, five, 12, five, five, 12. Okay, so we count off five books, 12 books, five books, five books, 12 books. And that's how it breaks down. The first section we call the law. That's where we have the beginnings in Genesis and we have the wandering in the wilderness and God giving all of the laws. And these books go into the detail about the sacrifices and the rituals and the building of the tabernacle and there's a lot of details in them and it chronicles the history of the nation of Israel wandering around in the desert waiting to go to the promised land. The next section is history and it begins with Joshua. Remember Joshua was our guy who had the nation walk around the city of Jericho and they blew their horns and poof, the walls fell down. So they enter the promised land. So we have a, a key point in history where we go to the place God wanted them to go. In here, we have the period of judges. And remember, judges is where we have those seven cycles that go on and on. And in, in here, we have a story that occurs during judges about Ruth. It's a love story. It's a beautiful story short little four four chapter book. And actually we, we studied that in reunion mm, 
springtime maybe? Anyway, um, it, it's a great picture of, of Jesus as our kinsman redeemer who helps take care of us and it's, it's super. Then first and second Samuel and first Kings go into the life of Saul, David, and Solomon. And in their order, Samuel is the prophet who, who anoints Saul the king and anoints David the king. And Samuel is the prophet who's called to say, you got a problem, you got a problem, fix it, fix it, fix it, as, problem, as prophets did all the time. Second Kings is where the kingdom splits. And so second Kings goes into the rule of Solomon and it goes into the divided kingdom. And then first and second chronicles tell the story of what went on in the divided kingdom. So it, um, it continues the story. So the history books really tell the chronology we talk about. And then Ezra and Nehemiah are about the rebuilding when they come back from, from, um, from exile. And Esther takes place in Babylon while they're off in exile. And so they come back and they work on rebuilding and we have our 400 solid silent years. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of books left over. Well, those books fit into the history of what we have. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon are books of poetry. And you may remember from your English lit class, we read poetry different. It functions differently. It might have a story, but oftentimes there's a lot of imagery in there. Um, they might be song lyrics. There's a variety of things um, that are in there. Job actually probably occurred during the time of Genesis, but it, it, it tells the story about this poor guy who the devil comes to is walking by God and God says, hey, you ever notice my guy Job? Job? He's wonderful. He's great. And, and Satan challenges God and says, that's because you take care of him and everything's good. You make his life miserable and, and your story, his story will change, you watch. Well, so poor guy loses his family, his house, his livelihood, loses everything, but he doesn't curse God. And his friends come and say, you must have sinned, you must. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. And, and he learns a lesson that God is God and God can do what God wants to, but we, Satan recognizes the faithfulness of this guy. And we see that God still is over it all and God rewards Job in the end and he winds up twice as rich with more kids. And, you know, he lives happily ever after. But we don't exactly know when that time, that story happens. So most, most scholars guess it probably happened during Genesis, but some people say it's just a fable, you know, a illustrative fa fable about trust God when things are bad. Psalms is the songbook that David wrote. Songs of worship. There's a couple other songs in there written by Moses and some of the worship leaders of the time. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon all come from Solomon, the most wise man. And Proverbs is full of these little pithy statements, kind of like you find in a fortune cookie. And they have stories about wisdom and um good life and money and all, all kinds of all kinds of things. Ecclesiastes, Solomon is reflecting on life. You know, he's rich, he has everything he needs. He has, he winds up having all these concubines and all these women. And he basically, he basically decides that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. He says, it's, it's all worthless without God. And Ecclesiastes also has a very famous passage to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, time to be born, a time to die. That's in the Song of Solomon, Solomon, I mean, in, in Ecclesiastes. The Song of Solomon is a love story between a man and a woman. And some people talk about it as, as, as a demonstration of married love. Some people talk about it as an allegory of the bride of Christ, the Christ and his bride. It's very sexual. In, in there. And it's, it's kind of interesting to have something that would be considered racy in the Bible, but it's there. We have all kinds of literature in there. The next two sections are prophets. We have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And we call those major prophets 
only because they're big books. They're thicker books and they have a lot in them. And each prophet came to the nation of Israel at a point in time, and this all happened during the divided kingdom, and said, hey, yo, dudes, you're messed up. Come back to God. And they, and again and again, and, the, and God uses all kinds of different ways to get their attention. Now, Jeremiah had to do crazy things, lie on your side for 30 days and then flip over and lie on your other side for 30 days. Like uh, Lamentations is Jeremiah's, I won't say whining, but it's his lament about how rotten things are. And so Jeremiah pours his heart out to God in there. So Lamentations and Jeremiah are connected. Ezekiel is a book that's full of symbols and a lot of stuff to come in the future because prophecy could be, could be something that was going to happen immediately, something that was going to happen a little later to those people, or something that was going to happen a long time later. And some of those, some of the prophecies that occur in Ezekiel and Daniel are things that are going to come in the end time. And so we kind of have to tease things out to figure out where they are. So some to the people and some to us. And we didn't necessarily know what was what. And there's a ton of symbolism. One of the symbols um, talks about these, these flying bugs like locusts, but they're so huge. They're bigger than a man and they're giant and the wings are spinning around. And scholars think that that's probably a helicopter. These people had no idea about machinery. And so they're using something they know to describe what they're seeing. And so it's, it's really fascinating to take a look at that, that kind of thing. Daniel is, is the first 12 chapters of Jan, Daniel is stories. And you hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel in the lion's den, and the building of the statue, and the writing on the wall, and all many stories you may be familiar with. But the second half of Daniel is all prophecy, which is why he winds up in the major prophets as opposed to history. Then the next and last 12 books in the Old Testament, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. People always mix up the order of them and you rarely hear preaching about them, but they have an equally important message to whoever they were preaching to. And God often uses pictures. Hosea, God says, go marry a prostitute. What? You want me to marry a prostitute? Okay. So he marries this prostitute and she becomes unfaithful to him and runs off. And God says, go back and get her. And in it, he's creating a picture for us about the nation Israel for us as Christians and the loving God who continues to come back again and again and again, because there's nothing we can do to drive away the love of God. Another one of the prophets is Jonah. Does that name ring a bell in any way? Yeah, Laura, how does well. Jonah? <laughs> Yeah, where's your bell? How does he? How does that ring a bell for you? The timing with the chimes in the background too. <laughs> um, uh, Jonah running away and getting swallowed up by a whale. Yes, exactly. Or that's that Jonah, and that's where that story is. <clears throat> Jonah was hanging out in his little hometown, and God says, "I want you to go to Nineveh," which was where the bad guys live that were taking people away and I want you to tell them to repent. What? A an equivalent would kind of be like us going to Afghanistan when the Taliban were in control. <laughs> I, I want you to go there and preach the guy, you know, and you, you can understand Jonah's reaction. So <laughs> instead of going east where God tells them, he goes off to Tarshish, which is in Spain, the opposite direction, and gets on a boat. But God has his way, and you know the storm comes up, and, and they throw him overboard, and the whale brings him where God wanted him to go, 
And so he goes around in Nineveh and says, repent, repent, you're a mess. God wants you to change. And they change. And he gets mad because they turn around. And God's like, hey, dude, what are you, what are you missing the point here? So anyway, there, there's story after story like that in the Minor Prophets that um, we're basically focusing on getting the people to turn back to God or has some hints of what's to come in the future. So five sections. And if you go through your Bible and you put lines between them, you remember 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. And you can just draw the lines and you can write them and it'll help you know what's, what's where. And knowing the sections really helps us figure out where the part of the story is. Now, the timeline of the Old Testament is basically contained in the law and the history. That's where all our squiggly line and all that dividing is. That's those books from Genesis to Esther. The, the poetry, the major prophets, and the minor prophets all fit in the latter half. Poetry basically in the United Kingdom and major minor prophets in the divided kingdom. And that's where those stories fit. So we have perspective. So when we were studying the book of Nehemiah, we were in the point where the, the Jews had been through all this stuff. They'd been through the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, off to exile and had come back. So it's a really different perspective than if we think that happened in Genesis. So understanding where stuff fits helps us have a better understanding of where they have been. So let's put these books in our timeline and see how they all fit. So this is the timeline that we learned <clears throat> and we looked at in the beginning. And so the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, covers that beginning piece of scripture. Then we have history starting with Joshua and the walls falling down in the cycles of the judges, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, coming back to return, to rebuild, and then so that's where the things fit and our poetry, major prophets, minor prophets fit in here. Now we always think about the timeline of the Old Testament and think, well, the Old Testament is the Bible the Jews have. Yes, indeed it is. But the Jews have a little bit different order for their, their Bible. And I, I reached out to a, 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 a client I had worked with in Australia and I said, can you tell me about the order of this, because this doesn't make sense. You have different sections than we have. And, and their sections are law, prophets, and writings. And I know this, this, is, this is not the best mm -hmm. illustration that we have, but they mm -hmm. divide the first five books of the, of the Bible that we call the law, and they call that the Torah. And the Torah would have been the scrolls that, that would have been in the temple along with some of the prophets. The second section they call the, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and they call them the former prophets and the latter prophets, and they are dividing them um, in the history, except they put Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, and Kings under prophets. I don't understand why they call them prophets. Samuel, yes, but the others are really basic stories, but that's how they organize that, mm -hmm. and then they have, they have their, um, their books organized there. And then they have what they call the writings. And the writings contain Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, or Song of Song of Ruth, which remember I said was a love story. Um, Lamentations, which you remember I said was Jeremiah whining about everything that was going on. So that makes sense that that would be there and not in the, with the prophets. Ecclesiastes, the vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And Esther, the story of the, the, the queen, the Jew who want, wins a beauty pageant basically and becomes queen and saves her people. But we'll cover that later on. And then they have Daniel because there's stories there, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So similar, but a little different. So if you're talking to a Jew and say, oh, we studied the story of Nehemiah, you know, it's one of the last, but, well, they might not have the different books. But if you look at the names, they're all the same, just different words. So this came from a rabbi. I, I was like, well, why do you have these arrows pointing one into the other? It's like, they have a relation. No, no, that's just helping you see the order. 
okay. So I would have designed it differently, but anyway, that's, that's how a Jew views their Bible. Now the New Testament is a little easier in its division. We basically have a section of history, which is the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are about Jesus and the book of Acts, which is the, um, the building of the church. Then the rest of the New Testament is all a bunch of letters sent to the churches. And then at the end, we have Revelation, which is prophecy. It's also a letter, but it primarily is prophecy. And this is one way to divide the New Testament. We can be a little more granular if we want, and we can have the Gospels. Gospel means good news, and this is the life of Christ. And then acts on its own as history, history of the church. And then the letters, believe it or not, have a pretty interesting organization. We have letters from Paul. He sends letters to churches and to people. So if you've got the I-A-N-S at the end, it's a type of people, like Galatians is the people in Galatia, Ephesians is the people in Ephesus. And when he writes them to people, Timothy's a name we use today, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, they were pastors. And so Paul writes to the church and he writes to these pastors. So these are the letters of Paul. Sometimes we call them the Pauline epistles, but they're letters of Paul to the church. And we see stories and connections between the history book of Acts and these letters. And it helps us chronicle the timeline of Paul and gets more detail. Now, the other letters are letters from people and they bear their name. James comes from James, the brother of Jesus. How would, how would it be to be a little kid brother to the Messiah? I imagine that. Well, anyway, that's James who wrote that. First and second Peter are Peter, the disciple who was always putting his foot in his mouth. First, second, and third John are written by John, the same guy who wrote the gospel of John when he was exiled in the uh, island of Patmos. And first, second, third John and Jude are very short. I refer to them as postcards. <laughs> they, 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 it's like it's like a little note that they sent with a point on them, and they they read very quickly, and they always have exhortation and, and things to do, things to uh, to understand. Now, I didn't talk about Hebrews. Hebrews, we don't know who wrote. Some people say Barnabas. Some people say Paul. The people who say it can't be Paul, he doesn't have a signature in it. All of Paul's letters have signatures and the people who argue for Paul will say, but there was a lot of persecution. And if this was known from Paul, it would be problematic. So anyway, Hebrews is, is a letter that is to Jewish people as opposed to Gentile people. And it refers to all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament. And it explains a lot of the symbolism in the law and the Torah and how it fits today and how Jesus answers that. And then Revelation, the prophecy, we had our dotted line and that's where Revelation fits in, except for the very beginning, which is about some of the churches. So, so if you wanted to find, if you wanted to find a story about Jesus, where would you look? Gospels. Yeah, the gospels. Now the gospels are not sequential, they are parallel and they tell the story from different angles. They're focused on different things, just like if you take a vacation with people and everybody's snapping pictures, your pictures look totally different. It's kind of like that. Their focus is a little different. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Mark was focused on the Greeks. Luke kind of focused on, on everyone, the Gentiles. And interestingly enough, Luke was a doctor. And they think he was probably Paul's doctor traveling with him. And he has all kinds of medical references in there. And he focuses a lot on the details of the miracles that a doctor would pay attention to that other people might miss. And it's just kind of, it's, it's interesting, those little things. And Mark, he's always in a hurry. Immediately we did this, immediately we did that. Mark was younger. And so that might've been, and Mark probably got his story from Peter. And that's one of the fascinating things in watching The Chosen is they have these characters interacting and, Mary tells the story of how Jesus was born to Mary Magdalene and had told it to, to 
um, Matthew as he was writing, or not Matthew, to, to uh, John. And it's just a fascinating interchange between them and understanding their character. Matthew was a tax collector, so he's a lot of detail in his stories. And then, then the, if you want to find out about the church and Paul, and the growth of the church, we'd be in Acts. Okay, let's put the books together with our timeline that we had before. So this was our timeline with the life of Christ, the persecution to get the people to go out and spread the gospel and then deliberately spreading the gospel that we had. And it breaks down like this. We have the gospels and then we have history. That's our, that's our timeline. Now you can end Jesus the, the, at the gospels and then start a new piece with Acts. But Acts has a little bit of quiet time in the beginning as the church is growing and preaching is happening before the crazy persecution goes on and they wind up spreading out. So that's why I, I keep them together. Focus in the beginning is on Jesus. Focus in that half is on the church. And all of our letters fit in. Oh, where did my letters go? Come back. <laughs> I wonder if the cat stepped on my keyboard. Well, the letters <laughs> fit into the history there. And, um, and that's where they go. So here we go. Here's our books of the Bible and where we go. And I said, Job goes in there. Exodus numbers, Exodus, Leviticus numbers, Deuteronomy come. And it's primarily about Moses leading the people. And Joshua comes, tackles, the wall falls down. And then our judges, and we have Deborah, Gideon, Samson, and Ruth. Those are names that might be familiar. Our United Kingdom with 1 Samuel about Saul, 2 Samuel about David, 1 Kings about Solomon, and then the, our poetry fits in here. Then 1 and 2 Chronicles tell the story of the divided kingdom, and we meet Elijah and Elisha and Daniel. They get carted off. We have our major prophets and our minor prophets saying, get your act together, get your act together. God's going to punish you, and then God punishes them, and off they go to exile, 70 years. During that time of exile, we see the story of Esther, where she is in Babylon, or Persia rather, and, and interestingly, the book of Esther never mentions the name of God, but it's very clearly God-centric, an interesting story. And then we have the return, and Ezra and Nehemiah come back, and we hear about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, Ezra rebuilding the people, Nehemiah rebuilding the walls, and Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple, and then we wait. And as the New Testament opens, we, we understand that God hadn't spoken in a while to them because here we had God talking to them through prophets and instructing them and teaching them, but 400 silent years, wait, mm -hmm. the Messiah is going to come, the Messiah is going to come, the Messiah is going to come. And so they would teach their children about the Messiah is coming and all the girls wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. Mm. Yeah. And so now we have our timeline of the New Testament, which focuses on Jesus in Matthew, Mark. Where did that go? Where are my books? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. And then our letters fit in. And our letters focus on the different churches from Paul when he's writing to the churches. And the people were pastors in those churches. Mm -hmm. And then the from people, Hebrews, James, and whatever was to the Christians who were scattered around. And then our dotted line represents okay, we're going to wait until God, until Jesus returns. And that is the book of Revelation. And Revelation tells us about the end times. Now there's another way that you can remember this, the order of this. And this is taught at Gordon College. Gordon College. And it's a pretty nifty thing. They use, they use the acronym. Okay. Nine, are we at nine? Thank you. They use the acronym casket empty to, to kind of portray casket sin leads to death. This, this method is not going to help you empty for the empty tomb. I never remember yeah. the words for empty, but I can remember the words for for the Old Testament. So let's go through them and see how, this is from um, Carol, what's her last name? Um, anyway, she's a professor there and she wrote this curriculum. So C stands for creation. 
A stands for Abraham because he's kind of the leading guy during that period of the patriarchs and starts the nation of Israel. S is for Sinai. That's the desert, of, uh, the desert, the wilderness wandering and the mountain of Sinai where they get the, the Ten Commandments and more of the law. We have our period of judges and then we have K. What do you think the K stands for? Any guesses? King? Yeah. It's for kings. It has the period of kings. And then E is for the exile. So we remember the people go into exile after the kingdom divided. And T is for the temple and the rebuilding of the temple and getting ready for the Messiah to come. So it's a nice way to kind of help put things in order as long as you can remember the letters, which I don't remember. <laughs> now, empty, they clearly retrofitted things to make it work, but you know, <laughs> she, she had to do something to get up a word for the New Testament that kind of had the difference between the death of the Old Testament and, you know, Stanley's the death and the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. So E is expectation. Okay, we had our 400 years. We, we were waiting for stuff. M for Messiah. Oh, good. This, this, this makes sense. P for Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came and the church was born. T for teaching. Hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's true. And Y for yet. So it works and it's a way that you can, um, you can connect the dots on, on things if you're good at remembering acronyms. I always have to look it up. Now, what does that last letter mean? But maybe you're better, which is why I, I did not teach from this perspective, but I wanna give it to you so that you have a feeling um, of, of one more tool that you can use to do things. And my next slide, I don't have the timeline done proportionally. I didn't go through like a project plan, planning to do that, to give you a feel of the timeline. The Old Testament you can see goes from 1500 and it may be going longer than that, just depending on whether you're a early creation or later creation, you know, they, they, they argue about all kinds of stuff. Um, in there. So whether it begins at 1500 or before then when God created the world, we have a starting point. And the exodus and the conquest is a relatively short period of time, all things considered. Judges is a pretty long period. That was 400 years of mess that they were dealing with. The United Kingdom was a fairly short period of time, a little over, well, it was three generations, so around 100 years. The divided kingdom stretched for 300 years, and then they went into exile for 70 years, so short, short period, and they came back to restoration. We had 400 silent years, and then look how tiny the New Testament is by comparison. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chronicled Jesus' life, and Jesus was crucified when he was 33. The book of Acts is a short period when the church was born, and then we wait. You know, Jesus was 2,000 years ago for us, so there's been a long time in that dotted line. Um, uh, yeah, there's been a long time in that dotted line but that'll give you the perspective of, of how things fit. It, it's almost, well, I won't say it's, it's proportional because we have the 400 silent years, but the, because the Old Testament took a lot of time, it gets a lot, of, a lot of ink in the Bible because there's a lot that went on covering a long period of time. So those are my slides and let's, let's go for questions and let's talk about what strikes you about hearing the story this way. Let's do what strikes you first. What struck you about hearing the story this way? Laura, go ahead. And I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other completely. Yeah. Um, I think I just, I found it helpful getting sort of a bird's eye view of things and that I, even in like in small groups or 
listening to sermons, I feel like you get a zoomed in version of one point in time. And I, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever like gotten a, a bird's eye view. So I think just having that context was really helpful and being able to like um, pick different like destination points along the way of being like, oh yes, I know this, I know this. Um, and be able to see that in the, the larger scheme of things was really helpful. Um, and also to just like breaking down how the different books are organized, um, whether it's like, you know, the law or history, or um, I think I had heard things like major and minor profits before, but didn't really know like what that meant. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was just, I think it was really helpful getting some uh, clarity over phrases that I've heard, but didn't really know what they meant and just like a, a broad perspective of things, so. Yeah. Super, super. How about you, Barbara? Yeah, ditto to all of that. And I, I really truly enjoyed your beginning when you had us draw because I, I, I was waiting to see where that was going to go. Yeah. Um, and it was just extremely helpful to, to integrate all of those different components. And that's what Laura was saying. Um, and I just think the way that you have presented it, Jean, it, I mean, your presentation is it, it, it's you have such humor in the way you're describing things that it really it really makes it um, so enjoyable to learn. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah I, I have taught Sunday school for a really long time to little kids, to adults, to teens. My favorite group was the last group I taught when I was in Providence, and it was Liberian refugees who were senior citizens who arrived in the United States with very little English, never having touched a pencil, pen, or book. And their goal was, I want to be able to read the Bible. And they had no idea how big of a task that was. But they loved the stories, and they, and they loved seeing the pictures, and they just they loved Jesus, and it was just so much fun teaching them and and I worked with them for about seven years and they really wanted a bible so I bought them all a bible and they would cart the bible around and every week I'd have to put a marker in where pastor was going to preach from so that they could open it up to that place and know that he was talking about that you know by the time we were done they could read their name and words like God and Jesus and others and that was always a delight for them because if we were singing a song on the overhead and oh there's Jesus it was great <laughs> so it made it a real a real blessing I also love teaching little kids and I had a bajillion songs about about the, the different yeah. Bible stories and mm -hmm. heroes and loved well I love your characterization of the, <laughs> the letters that are very small as postcards that that was marvelous <laughs> Yeah. yeah, one of my Sunday school classes was Postcards from God. <laughs> different books, and it was great because they are, they're tiny. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you compare that with the book of Romans, which is like 16 chapters of very dense, dense theology. That was a letter, too. And I, you know, I, I have to wonder how sophisticated the Romans were that Paul could put this heavy tome together for them. It was great. They they shared stuff when the, the letters were circulating, but that's who his focus his focus group was. I just put the um, I, let me share this again. I just put the the handout in the chat, and I'll show you how you can um, get to it. It should have appeared in the chat, and if you click on it, you can open it and save it. You know, okay. you can open the file. But you can also, when we have a chat, you can download and save the chat, which will save it, it with it. And when you do that, when you save the chat, it saves it into a mysterious folder no one can ever find. So they put a hyperlink into it and that saved the chat, but it does not bring the, you know, here we go. It just tells the text there. So you have to literally download the, um, the lesson and you can, you, know, you can click uh -huh. on it, open it, and then file save as to save somewhere on your desktop or wherever you you want to have it and you are, are getting the animated version just like <laughs> I showed you so so when you see the slides um, you'll see you know they look like this and they have they, they don't build but 
if you choose to go into slide view, into slide, oh, slide view is over here. Uh, let's see, escape out of this and let me go into slide view again. I mean, you're going, okay, so you go in into this and, and it, you know, you can see right. the animation will build as you click. So, okay. So now you can put notes on your little line, but it's really helpful to just go back over the line and say, what's going on? Do I remember what happened? And you can fool your friends and say, <laughs> you know what that means? And so it's kind of fun when people say, oh, the Bible's so hard to understand. Well, it, in some ways, yes. But in other ways, we are so focused on little segments. You know, the stories all have value and each piece is important, but understanding the bigger picture helps. And I got to really understand this in the 90s, 2000s, when Bruce Wilkerson's organization was going around the country teaching walk through the Bible. And they had hand motions and gestures for the whole thing. And it was, it was great fun. But all of a sudden, it made sense to me, all these stories that I knew in pieces. It was super helpful. Hmm. So what questions do you have for tonight? I'm always curious about why there was nothing to really report on for 400 years. I mean, something must have happened in that time. <laughs> well, I know the people were marking their time, but God was silent. Huh. I, I wonder if it was to really make them want him. But mm -hmm. I also think about how many generations would have died in that period waiting for the Messiah. Right. But they were all eagerly looking for the Messiah and based on the stuff they'd learned in the prophets, they were expecting a conquering king to come in. Well, that conquering king is coming when he comes again. And they, you know, he was going to overthrow the government and they really had interesting designs on him about, you know, well, well, Jesus, you're supposed to do it this way. Yeah, right. I'm God, you're not. So. <laughs> I just have, I wonder how often he shook his head in, in, the, in the chosen, you see that he really, the author really humanizes the disciples and they're fighting with each other and they're camping and somebody's cooking dinner and somebody's complaining <laughs> about something. And it, the opening episode actually introduces you to Matthew, who's young. And he's trying to learn the books of the, the, the some of the Psalms and understand this whole God thing, because he's trying to figure it out. And you have the older disciples who grew up Jewish and knew all this, and they're kind of coaching him. It's, it's, just, it's interesting to think about that, that mm. um, connection. That you what about you, Laura? Any questions for tonight? Um, I was looking at my notes, which um, sort of similar to Barbara. It, it's more of like a reflection mm -hmm. along the same lines of like, Gosh, 400 years is a long time for silence. I also was thinking about um, the, like, I think it was on one of your slides when you were doing, when you were showing the timeline. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking like how much it would sort of think to be born during the time where like exile was happening and like realizing that, that your life, you get like a, a blip of this giant greater story, right? Um, and looking back now, it, 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 I don't know, it felt really striking seeing like how small of a period of time like exile was in that case um, to all of these other stories of the Bible. Um, yeah, but it, I guess just a, a statement around perspective perhaps of like, yeah. you know, the, what we're able to see and um, sometimes the greater greater perspective of the story going on. So not a question, but yeah. <laughs> reflection. Yeah, absolutely. We, we don't think about the time perspective. And if you think about 400 silent years, Let's subtract 400 from now. That's when the pilgrims arrived. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how much has changed in our world mm -hmm. in that time and how long they waited for the promise. But they know the promises of God are yes and amen. And they, they were trusting God to come through in this. Even as we saw that in the cycle of judges, they messed up, 
life was really bad, but they could call out to God for help. And he provided, he provided a deliverer for them. I will go into a bit more depth on that um, next time. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through in depth, well, I won't say in depth, instead of being 50,000 feet, we'll probably be about 30,000 feet, but we'll, we'll take a look at what went on and a little bit more into the book so we have a, a feel for the individual books. Can you also explain a little bit about, um, I, know I, I, I know there are some other books that exist and they are not in many Bibles, but they're, and I forget the name of the Bible that, that, that includes those books. I'm a little rusty on this. Can you just? Yeah, sure. They're in the Catholic yeah. Bible and they're called the Apocrypha. Right. And and Protestants reject the Apocrypha because some of the stories just don't line up with the mm. way the stories go. We have the Gospel of Barnabas, and we have another story where in one of them, Jesus is a little boy and a bird dies and he feels bad for the bird and he picks up the bird and heals it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about, you know, there's, there's things that, mm -hmm. that, that, when the scholars were putting things together and figuring out what the order was going to be, they had pretty stringent criteria. And if it didn't fit, they didn't include it. So it, it's not that it's heresy necessarily, but it mm -hmm. isn't complete. Because we know that the Bible was written, as scripture says, by holy men inspired by God to, to write the words that they had but you see the personalities of the authors especially as you're reading the gospels you know you see mark always in a hurry and luke focused on details and as they're retelling the story yes it was god speaking to communicate but their personalities come through same thing with the the letters from paul compared to the letters from peter peter was a fisherman paul was was a pharisee actually and he was right. a scholar and he studied it. He was the Jew of Jews. And he brags about that. And he, he says, it's all done. It's, it doesn't matter. I, I was the guy. I, and, and I was killing Christians. So he, he talks about his credibility, um, introduces that actually in Galatians when he's writing to the church. Because uh, into the church, there's become a problem because people, Jews are coming in and saying, oh, in order to become a Christian, you have to be circumcised and you have to follow the law. You have to do all this. Otherwise, you can't become a Christian. And Paul's like, wait, wait, wait. It's about grace. You believe it's grace. You're saved. It's not works. You don't have to do stuff. And he gets mad at the Galatians because there's become a division and, and a bunch of the people are, are buying the party line of, oh, well, we all got to get, we all have to get circumcised. That'd be a pretty big barrier in Gentile territory for somebody to believe in God, especially as an adult. So Jesus knocks down all the barriers to us. And, and even when, um, when he dies on the cross, one of the things that you read about the earth shook and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Mm -hmm. That veil kept people out of the Holy of Holies. Only the priests could go in there. And now we have free access. It's just so cool. Jean, I have a quick follow-up question. Now I'm looking a little bit at my notes too. Um, when you're talking about in the Old Testament, after the like United Kingdom part, mm -hmm. there's the divided kingdom, and you're talking about like the two branches of I think it's like ten tribes and twelve tribes, or sorry, ten and two tribes, mm -hmm. right? And you're mentioning was it the tribes of Israel and the tribes of Judah? Judah. Judah. Can you share a little bit more? I feel like those are also names that I've heard, but I also don't really know like how they connect in the grand scheme of things too. Yeah. The nation of Israel was Jacob's 12 sons. He had 12 sons and each of them got a tribe, except one of them did. Levi, the Levites were priests, so they didn't. And so two of Joseph's sons, which are kind of interesting, Manasseh and Ephraim got we got tribes. And so they were kind of organized like relatives would have been mm -hmm. organized in things. And before the divided kingdom, we refer to the nation of Israel as that whole group. And when they had the divided, the, the division, the civil, the civil uh, division, they wanted to keep that name. So they kept the name. 
And Judah was one of the two tribes. Well, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to remember the, the second tribe. Oof, it little, it'll come to me at three o'clock in the morning. You know, Floyd <laughs> is a little guy who filters in your brain to find those things. Anyway, um, it, it, it was the nation of Judah. And, um, and uh, of course, I'm not going to remember the second tribe. But it was those two tribes. And actually, we hear of Jesus as the Lion of Judah. And so there, there were connections and that's the lineage that, that came. And that's also the lineage that David's kings, you know, his, his descendants came from in there. And then two follow-up questions for that too. Of course. Um, so I, after the like return and the, or right before the return, the, the rebuild, is it based, I'm just looking at the diagram here. Is it assumed that the like, the 10 tribes of Israel that split off, that still kept the name, were they like no more or did they? Okay, gotcha. Oh, they so it was just the, the two, I don't know, the two tribes that like returned, did they reclaim the name then? Yeah, they refer okay. to them. Okay. They, they refer to themselves as, as the nation of Israel. Yeah. Okay. They didn't, they didn't become Judah for good. But the people that, that hung around during that time became the Samaritans as they intermarried. And the, the Jews referred to them as half-breeds. Like, well, yeah, kind of, but they were still worshiping and they worshiped on the mountain and they had different places, but they were still looking for the Messiah. And Jesus goes to the Samaritan and the Samar to Samaria, he winds up in Samaria a couple times, and he has this huge evangelistic thing in Samaria when he goes to the woman at the well, which is a story you probably have heard, where the disciples are wandering around, and he says, go get some lunch, and he hangs out at the well, and this woman comes in the middle of the day. Well, women would come and get water in the morning, so it was unusual, and he says, can I have a drink, and she's like, what, what are you talking to me? I'm a woman. You'd be like, what, what is this, and so he, he challenges her about her lifestyle and how she's had multiple husbands and she's living with a guy now. And she, she gets, she's amazed. And she, she talks to him about worship and, and other things. And she leaves her water and runs back to the city and tells everybody she knows, I've met the Messiah, come and meet him, come. And this whole group of Samaritans comes and meets Jesus and becomes followers. And so, the disciples are annoyed at Jesus that he talked to a woman and, you know, he's talking to all these outcasts. What did they, <laughs> they would tell God how he was supposed to behave a lot. Like, <laughs> and, um, and so it, it's interesting to watch that. It's also interesting how they're traveling. Now my, they were traveling on foot. And so we, in order to get from into Jerusalem and other places, you often had to go right through Samaria, but they wouldn't go through Samaria. They would walk all the way around to avoid going where those people live. It's an interesting thing, though, as, as we're doing God and race in church, you know, we've been going on for a long time. And even when, when Jesus gives the, the commandment for them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and onto the uttermost, Kind of interesting, you know. I don't know in Boston if, if the if the metaphor of go to Cambridge, go to Boston Metro, go to Roxbury and Mattapan. No, I, I'm I'm okay with those neighborhoods, but a lot of people aren't because they're different. And then you know Massachusetts and go to the world while you're at it. He was very deliberate in the way he told them. And he wanted the Samaritans included. And the uttermost included the Gentiles. Even when Paul starts his ministry, when he goes into a city, the first place he hits is the temple. He talks to Jews. And the Jews were not having it. And the Jews from Jerusalem were following him around saying, don't listen to him, don't listen to him, don't listen to him. And he said, not enough with you. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And God made him the evangelist of the Gentiles. Pretty cool. That you said you had two questions. Did I did I get both of them? Um, I ooh, I think so. Um, it, so it, let me just, let me. Can oh, I yeah. just ask a question based on your question? Yes, <laughs> yes. of course. Yeah. Love 
so so Laura just asked about the the two tribes the the so the Judah then adopted the name Israel. Why? I'd like to know the rationale for that. Why didn't they just keep Judah? That's interesting. Well, Israel was kind of the big name, God's chosen people, the nation Israel. I guess I guess it was maybe an identity hmm. thing. Those huh. guys took our name, like like we had the North and the South, and we considered ourselves the United. Now you're from Virginia. I could be wrong about this, but we considered <laughs> ourselves the United States, and they were the rebels that broke away, I, I, the Confederate states. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the kind of a similar thing, I think, that went. Although it wasn't the like the South would have been the North breaking away. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to look back. It's like, oh God, look how I, I always, when I, when I teach this, I always think about the tenacity of God. They messed up, they came after, they messed up and he came again and they messed up and they messed up and they, and, but he still sent his son, you know, like I'm going to fix this for good and you should get it. And we don't. And so many people just disregard Jesus and they just, it's, it's too easy. Well, yeah, that's the point. He wants you to come and he wants to change you. He wants to make a difference. And he wants us to make a difference. You know, he wants, he wants us to demonstrate God and his love and, and the difference he makes in our lives. One of the most profound experiences I ever had in understanding sharing the gospel was, you know, when the church was growing in Acts, they didn't have the Bible to point to verses, <laughs> to tell people. Right. Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. They didn't have a little tractor. They didn't have it was like they talked about their life and what they knew and how Jesus changed them. Which is just so cool. So mm -hmm. we can say, you know, before I met Christ, I was like this. I met Christ, here's how I met Christ. After I met Christ, let me tell you the difference. It's made it hasn't been perfect, but boy, it's so nice <laughs> having an advocate and an ally. He's a difference maker for us. Which is pretty cool. He just loves us so much. Which is neat. Did we find the other question? Um, I think it is. It has gone, but it will likely also return at three a.m. this morning, and I will <laughs> jot it down. Write it down. <laughs> we'll week. talk about yeah. it next time. We'll talk about it next time. I will send you this recording if you want to share it with people and say you should really come. This was really good. <laughs> So, you know, we don't close the door and say nobody can come, um, but I, I will, I will send the recording and I think this is the version that puts the transcript in it with the closed captioning. I have so many Zoom accounts. I have one for each college that I teach at and then the one at work and I never remember which is attached to which. So we may have closed captions, which is <laughs> all right. Yes. Does that does that mean too? It, I know not next Monday, but the Monday after, I might not be here. I TBD. But if I'm not here, does that mean I can just watch the recording and then jump in the following week? Yep. Something. Yep. 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 I think we hit President's Day or something along the way. That's a holiday, yeah. and if it's just the three of us, we can talk about you know how we want to if we want to modify. So okay. we'll take it as it comes. So are you going someplace fun for your maybe not be here? Um, my husband and I are going to go to the Berkshires for that long weekend. Um, I don't know exactly when we'll be back. So yeah. Nice. Have don't you been to the Berkshires before? I think I have mainly just like driven through them. I haven't spent extended time, um, but they're beautiful. So there is a couple of interesting things in hmm, the main city there that's gone out of my head, but Jonathan Edwards, who was the preacher who did sinners in the hand of a mighty God and the church shook. And it's a real big famous sermon from the 1700s had a church there reaching out to Indians, native Americans, and it's a museum now. And that's pretty cool. There's also the um, Norman Rockwell museum, which I thought Norman Rockwell, he did corny covers on Saturday night. <laughs> I mean, it's not Saturday night, like Saturday evening post. Um, it's a pretty amazing museum. So <laughs> That's there. So depending on your weather, if you're looking for stuff to do, those are two options. Barbara, have you been out to the Berkshires? I have. 
Well, yeah. what would you add? Um, so just a little warning that uh, reception on cell phones tends to be a bit spotty there. So it's pretty easy to get around, but I did have a little bit of a tricky time when I couldn't get reception to pick up. Mm. So it's not a bad idea to have like a map, like a, a real old map in the <laughs> car. <laughs> Are you are you going skiing? We don't have any itinerary right now. We just have a place to stay and a rental car to get there. So oh, <laughs> we're open to suggestions. <laughs> but ah, okay. the Red Lion Inn is an old historic inn there. That's great food, great historic. Mm -hmm. And that's in Stockbridge, I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Stockbridge, right near the Red Lion Inn, there's all these really cool old stores and it's very mm -hmm. quaint. Yeah. That's Shopping. lovely there. S H O P P E S. That's, <laughs> that's I look for those when I travel the shoppies in the cathedral. So mm. it's it's great. So well, we'll we'll hear more as it as you come. All right. Well, it's 9 30. Thank you for spending two hours with me. It's been a delight. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week or heaven, whichever comes first. <laughs> Have a good Thank week. you so much. <laughs> Thank you.